Hey, Foxy Stars, your girl Foxy, and I'm back with, guess what? Choosy Joy. We are on part four of this book. I hope it is helping you as it has been helping me. And this chapter is titled, Enjoy Your Presence. And it has eight chapters to it, so I'll be reading the first four. Then I'll be back with the next four, part two of chapter four. Let's hop right into it. Enjoy your presence. Learning to live in the present moment is part of the path of joy. Nestled in between our past and future is an elusive present moment. It's the only moment we ever truly have. It's the home of happiness in life. And yet, it's the one room to which we struggle to find the key. While the door to our past swings open with a gentle nudge and our future fears are so eager to invite us in, the present moment and the sublime happiness is offers takes effort, awkwardness, awareness, and discipline to unlock. One large scale study found that people spend 47% of their time thinking about other things as opposed to being fully present in what they're doing. It's fair to say the majority of us could use a helping hand to understand how to be more fully present. This is your life. Regaining control of your inner narrative. There are times in our lives when we have to realize our past is precisely what it is. And we cannot change it. But we can change the story. We tell ourselves about it. And by doing that, we can change the future. Eleanor Brown quote that. We make sense of our lives through the stories we tell about them. The story of your life, much like any fictional story, is likely to have villains, plot twists, tragedies, and triumphs. It's through stories that we are able to create a sense of meaning from life. Our ability to construct an inner narrative that connects our past, future, and present is a universal human quality. Psychologists refer to our natural ability to tell stories as our narrative identity and define it as a selective and subjective account of how one came to be the person one currently is. Most importantly, psychologists stress that how we construct our story plays an essential part in determining our level of happiness. Tune in to your story, Foxy Stars. It is often easier to observe other people's narratives of the past than to see our own. It's easy to spot our friend with the victim narrative who repeatedly tells a story of how it always seems to happen to her as she jumps from one chapter of drama to the next and to recognize that everything happens for a reason. Friend who takes life downturns and transfer them to opportunities, finding glimmer of hope even in their darkest time. As an observer, we can see how a simple shift in perspective changes the experience of each of our friends. However, our own involvement in our own story can make it hard to tune into the narrative that's running in our head. As you tune into your story, notice your perspective widen, enabling you to step outside of the role of character and firmly place yourself as the author of your narrative. Assuming the role of an author can help us regain control of our personal story, and we can come to experience our consistent ability to edit, refine, and turn the page to start a new chapter. We have a daily delight. Whether you feel negative emotions about the recent or distant past, take a journal or paper and write your answers to these prompts. Noticing how they help you tune into and observe the story of the past you are creating. What am I telling myself about this situation? When I tell the story, how does it make me feel? How is this story serving me? Ponder on that one. Okay, we have a exercise. Inner narrative and happiness. Our inner narrative is explicitly linked to happiness, and thanks to research by psychologists, we now have a greater understanding behind the science of structuring our story for happiness. This is not about self-delusion, in-depth analysis of logistic 
patterns from people who have experienced trauma and gone on to create meaningful and happy lives shows us how we can do the same. We may not have had control over the external events that happened to us, but we do have the internal control to shape the story we allow to tell. Find the meaning. Research has shown that people who found meaning or gain an increased understanding about themselves from a particular turning point in their lives demonstrate higher levels of optimism. How can I help others learn from the experience I've had? How could this empower me to create change in the future? What good could can I allow to come from this? As you reflect on the negative story of the past, it can be helpful to find some meaning. Ask yourself, what lessons could I learn from this situation? What insights are there to be had? What did it teach me? Add some redemption. Stories of redemption begin with the bad and end with the good. If you had a bad experience, try to reflect on the good that is brought to your life. However small, it could be the strength it gave you or how it shaped the person you are and or becoming for the better. Stories that have redemption in them can have a powerful effect. For example, one study found that adults and alcoholics anonymous who told a redemptive story about their last drink to participate whose narrative redemptive story about their last drink were more likely to report staying sober for four months compared to participants whose narrative did not contain a feature of redemption. I have incorporated redemption to stories in my own life particularly around my unhealthy friendship. It's still painful to recall the memories memories of how I was treated about those relationships, not in my already low self-worth. But whenever I reflect on it, it pushed, it gave me to find my own voice to set firm boundaries. I reminded, reminded of how valuable this experience was. Now I'm strong, strangely both hurt and grateful for these those experiences. It helped me to evolve from a people pleaser to someone who strongly values their own worth. Tell a growth story. Stories of how we have positively grown from our experience are linked with higher levels of well-being and happiness. As you reflect on your past, think about how you have developed. How did the experience help you grow as a person? How has the past helped you make the better decisions about the future? I have seen this technique powerfully impact the lives of people I work with. These people have turned burnt, burnout from work, social anxiety, addiction, and failed marriages into growth stories. It can be so empowering when we decide for ourselves. This isn't how it ends. This is actually where my story begins. Just for fun. We don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. That was quoted by George Bernard Shaw. I'm not really sure at what point we can't come out of the cocoon to play and emerge as serious adults with long to-do lists. When we're younger, when we're younger, adulthood is often revered as the point where we finally get to do whatever we want. As a child, I used to imagine that my adult life would be a bit like of the character Josh in the classic movie Big. If you haven't seen Big, 12-year-old Josh makes a wish on a Zotar fortune telling machine at a fairground to become a grown-up and it comes true. Like Josh, I imagine that grown-up Sarah would stay up late and have a trampoline in her living room and abundance of cool toys. In, re in reality, life as a grown-up means I struggle to find time for play. The particular jobs, responsibilities, and obligations in life can overcrowd my diary and my mind, slowly edging happiness out of the present. But when life feels overwhelming and the present moment feels hard to assess, play often offers a sanctuary and a release that we desperately need. All right, Foxy Stars, just for fun. <laughs> Playtime. Play is when we engage in activity for the purpose of joy with little concern over the outcome. What creates that feeling of play will be unique to each of us. It might be hosting a game night, playing football, taking part in a murder mystery, even evening, skateboarding, surfing, dancing, acting, or cooking. But when we feel low or just a bit off, the extra effort required to, to create room to play could feel like a stretch too far. After all, a much easier choice 
After all, it's much easier choice to numb our negative emotions with our televisions or phones than to get creative about what we can find to play. Nonetheless, various pieces of research indicate that summoning the, the extra energy to invest in play can pay off repeating immediate and long-term benefits. Hmm. Boxing stars, what do you like to do? I love to play baseball. I love to read. I love to dance. Hmm. What do you love to do? What's your playtime? Play and happiness. Play is an integral part of the happiness equation. It provides to reduce stress and is associated with the higher levels of life satisfaction. What's more, the benefits of play are almost immediate, given that we're more likely to assess the psychological state of flow. Flow is when our actions and awareness merge, totally engaging us in the present moment. It's in the state of flow that people report. Being in a zone is where our sense of time is distorted. It speeds up or slow down, and our sense of self, worries, and inner critics devolve. Flow hits our inner voice mute button by heavenly investing our attention in the present. Perhaps this escape from our overactive mind is one of the reasons why psychologists hail flow as a secret to happiness. Play can remind us, even if we're just for a few moments, that life, few moments, that life can be light and enjoyable. It's a great choice to engage in the present moment, get out of our heads and into our lives. Ooh, exercise. Establishing and expanding your level of play. This three-step process is a variable starting point for establishing and expanding your current level of play. Establishing and expand, expand our levels of play can feel awkward or even silly. I remember the resistance I felt as a, at a seminar when a speaker suggested that we make more time for play. I recall rolling my eyes and whispering to a colleague besides me, sure thing, let's just get all our clients bouncing around on bouncy castles and all their worries would just fly away. My resistance was triggering, triggered because the speaker had hit a nerve at the lack of play in my own life. I spent too much time in my head thinking seriously adult thoughts and not enough time having fun and laughing. If you feel a similar resistance, that's okay. Play won't solve all your grown-up problems, but it will offer a brief, important opportunity to escape them for a short time. Step one, rate the level of play in your life from one to 10, which one being no play and 10 being my life is full of play. Step two, if you feel your play score could be higher, make a list of 10 play activities. It's useful to think about activities where you find joy, feel in the zone, lose track of time, and once enjoyed as a child. If you find it difficult to write 10, here are some suggestions that might help spark a few ideas. Host a game night. Download interactive apps to play with others. Make a visit to a board game cafe. Dance, whether it's in a dance class or you're just dance in the living room of some of your favorite songs. <laughs> Use websites like meetup.com or Facebook to find events happening in your area. Play sports like football, basketball, or tennis. Get crafty with painting, knitting, drawing, and even an adult coloring book. Try a new gym class. Take an improv class or acting class. Think about and revisit old childhood games you used to love to play, in, to play like hide and seek or I spy. Y'all know it's trouble. Trouble and Monopoly. Yes. Change the game with them two games. <laughs> and we also change the rules. Okay, step three. Write down when and where next week you will create room for play. It can be as small as making five minutes a day to dance like no one's watching or as big as pushing yourself out of your comfort zone with an, unpro with an improv class. Release your judgment. Everyone seems to have a clear idea of how other people should lead their lives, but none about his or, his or her own. Paulo Kolaho said that 
We share the present moment with other people and when they don't act in accordance with our expectations, it can disrupt our thoughts and dominate our conversations. A throwaway comment or a sour tone email from a colleague is sometimes all it takes for us to pick up our judgment judgment hammer and put others people's behavior on trial. But we do this often as the expense of our own time and happiness by tormenting ourselves with a cascade of why questions. Why did they say that? Why did they do that? Why are they treating me like this? In the absence of other person's defense, our brains construct elaborate, elaborate subjective stories. Judges other consumes our thoughts and focus and unnecessarily waste energy. Like a happiness sponge, judgment can soak up not only our own happiness, but happiness of those around us. So understanding when it's best to drop the judgment hammer and let it go can help us create space for happiness in the present. Is it true? We like the world to make sense and for people to act in accordance with our norms and values. When people deviate from our invisible rules, it can feel difficult to get past. We find ourselves talking excessively to almost anyone, typically apart from the person involved about what happened, seeking reasons and validations of our own values. But in the process of telling our, a, our side of the story, we can distort the truth, mistakenly using a small part of the person's behavior to construct an entire picture of who they are. The surge of moral sobriety that accompanies it can feel good. In the past, I slammed the hammer of judgment on people and found them guilty of being insensitive and selfish. On to let them cover deeper reasons for their behavior that come from that came from a past of stress, hurt, and hurt and anxiety. It is moments like that I wish I stepped outside my individualistic world, tried to understand a person's motivation, and seeing a bigger, bigger picture. Taking this approach will have improved my happiness and afforded me the opportunity to improve theirs too. Judging others in happiness. Human beings are hardwired for connection and relationships, are vital for everyone's well-being. However, inevitably, in relationships, wires get crossed and conflict can occur. But it's possible and iron out. It's possible it is iron, possible to iron out our differences and research indicates that empathy can help. Empathy helps us step off our moral soapbox and close the gap between our assumptions and reality. Even though it feels quicker and easier to judge, taking time to think about the other person's point of view can be extremely beneficial. One way to cultivate empathy is to step into the other person's shoes, consider their point of view and get a sense of their situation and what they might be thinking or feeling. Ask yourself, what assumptions have you made about this situation? What values and beliefs have the person challenged? Know that ensuring someone is empathetic doesn't mean we have to exercise the other person's behavior. Oh, no, doesn't mean we have to excuse the other person's behavior. If you feel someone did hurt your feelings or acted without care, there, then be assertive and take action where possible, setting clear boundaries for yourself. Happy tip. Relationship play a huge role in our level of happiness. Knowing someone who makes you happy makes you 15.3% more ha likely to be happy. What's more, a happy friend or a friend will increase your happiness to by 9.8%. Mm. We got another exercise. Rising above above judgment. Our judgment of others was once a useful survival mechanism that would alert us to people who might harm them. But now judgment can get in the way negatively impacting the other person and affecting our own lives and happiness. If someone at work has stolen your ideas, your friend has been continually putting you down, a loved one has been showing you lack of respect. Here are some tips to help you resolve it. Direct communication. If we seek to understand someone else's behavior, it's logical that we go directly to them. However, for some, this can be easier said than done. If you feel able to approach the person directly, remain calm and objective by using phrases like, I find this a tough conversation to have, but could you help me understand why, or I'd like to understand more about, insert what happened. I don't know if you realize, but it caused me to feel and insert your feelings. 
Direct communication, however uncomfortable, allows the other person to share their story. You might find you're pleasantly surprised with how grateful the person is to share their vision of events. Let it go or let them go. If you don't feel the, if you don't feel this explanation is enough and com conflict still arises, then you may feel it necessary to reflect on whether the relationship is one you need to end. Ending relationships can feel very difficult, especially if it's a close friend, partner, or family member. Each case is individual, but when it comes to toxic relationship, trust your gut and value your worth. Comparisons. The comparisons catapult. Comparisons fuel feels feelings of unworthiness, unfairness, and envy, and jealousy that cultivate us. Um, that cat catapult <laughs> us out of the present moment into the this, 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 this desert of inequity. Lord, I am so tongue twisted right now. Forgive me, Foxy Stars. Comparisons can have the power to make our hearts sink and our minds wander in an instant. It leads us to questions. If we're doing enough or if we're good enough and to ponder the perceived unfairness of why them and not us, when we snarl at the comparisons trap, it's tempting to dish our criticism or slightly wish for others to fail and attempt to make us feel better. Comparisons is a complex emotion and an opportunity to step into it catapult, catapult seems endless in a hyper filter hyper connected word world but taking the time to look at the cause of comparison feelings can be very revealing you are enough the evolutions of lives against others is often driven by the underlying fear that we are not enough we can see we convince ourselves that if we have what they have then we will feel loved validated and accepted and life will be complete the rise of the, ooh, of the influencer has tapped into these fears and opened up a new marketing stream for watch bands, clothing range, and the diet industry to offer solutions to fill the void we feel. Comparisons can gnaw our self-esteem and make us hypercritical of ourselves and others. In these times, self-love and positive self-talks are crucial antidotes as we gently remind ourselves that we are on our own unique journey more than ever we should remember the high, highlighted reels of people's lives we see isn't a whole picture but it's an unsus unsustainable merge of their best bits we never really know the journey that that person went on to get there the struggles hard work self-doubt and the feelings of inadequacy they face along the way as you feel comparison take over your world and snatch your happiness, remember you are enough. We all are. Another person's success doesn't devolve or take away, doesn't devalue or take away anything from you, your life, and your journey. Oof. Comparisons and happiness. Social comparisons. Comparisons is normal part of human behavior that's easy to fall into, but it takes efforts to pull ourselves out from the bad habit. Interestingly, one of the main reasons why we compare ourselves with others is when we don't have objective clarity over our own goals. Studies have revealed that when we are clear of our own internal standards, we pay less attention to the performance of others and feel happy about ourselves. Woo, I can relate, relate, relate. Okay. When we're uncertain about our level of self-work and abilities, we make more frequent social comparisons to gauge our performance. Yet, that's about as useful as trying to work out if you're taller than someone who, who don't know your own height. Being in tune with our own inner barometer, uh, internal barometer of success means understanding the answer to the question, is this enough for me? Exercise, managing comparisons. Social comparisons is natural, but when it, is, but when it caught the parts you out of the present moment, here are some practical steps you can take to manage it 
manages impact. Strangers and social media. A study found that people who follow fewer strangers on Instagram were associated with decreased depressive symptoms. If you wouldn't invite a stranger to you, if you wouldn't invite a stranger into your home who made you feel bad about your life, why let them into your social media world? If you find a particular person's page or account triggers you, then exert your power by unfollowing them. That one right there. <laughs> Comparison can feel uncomfortable, but it can also shed light on opportunities for personal growth. Try asking yourself, what is it about this that makes me feel incomplete? What is this telling me about myself? Is this response helpful to my self-esteem? What is more positive way to look at this? Increase your self-worth. When we feel good on the inside, we feel less of the need to compare ourselves and gain validation from others. If you feel your self-worth can do with a booth, try reading positive affirmations to yourself in the mirror every day. Yes, you do. You are beautiful. Yes, I am. Positive affirmations affirmation said every morning Whew. affirmations you might choose include i am enough i am worthy of happiness i am where i need to be and happiness flows through me did that not just speak of foxy and i just said it to my foxy stars so guys that is the last part the, the first four chapters of part four and I will be back tomorrow. I shouldn't say tomorrow, but I'll be back in the next couple of days with the last four chapters of Choosing Joy. And I hope you decide to choose joy because I am choosing joy every day. And with that being said, everyone have a wonderful night. And like I always say, go to sleep with rainbows and unicorn dreams and wake up feeling like, woo, it is a beautiful day. And don't forget your daily affirmation. I am beautiful. Yes, you are. Love my foxy stars. Bye.